All right, welcome back everyone. Next up we have Andrew Tridgell talking about Canberra UAV and Argy Pilot. Uh, Tridge does invite questions uh, during or after, but please just remember to wait for the microphone. So if you have a question, uh, just wait. I'll run over to you with the microphone. Don't feel ashamed. You've got to wait five or ten seconds. That way we can get it for the recording. All right, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Trent. <laughs> right, good morning, everyone. So I'm here talking about my obsession with flying robots again. And uh, so more crazy flying machines, uh, part of a, a group called Canberra UAV and a uh, free software project called Argypilot. So uh, every two years there is this competition uh, called the Outback Challenge. And this UAV competition um, is aimed to advance the state of the art in uh, UAVs. And the focus is on search and rescue applications, but the, really it advances the art in many, many areas of UAVs, making them more reliable, more capable, and in particular, it does it in a way that is as open as possible. So I've been involved in this for now about six years, um, and the competition is every two years, so we've entered it uh, three times in the last six years, um, and our team, Canberra UAV, has won the competition the last three times. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit in this talk about the 2016 competition. Um, each time the, the competition is completed, the organisers make it harder next time to push the uh, art of UAVs a little bit further. And each time, uh, so that when they first started running the competition a long time ago, they went about uh, five or six times the competition ran before they even got uh, teams managing to get a UAV into the target area for a search, right? Um, so the UAVs were just crashing basically, you know, within typically a few hundred meters of takeoff. Uh, but um, UAVs have advanced a lot in the last few years. And uh, so it's now the competition, the, the bar has been raised, it's been made harder and harder. And I'll be talking initially about the 2016 competition and uh, what we had to do, and then a bit about the 2018 competition coming up this year, and also other areas that Ardu Pilot and Canberra UAV are working on. So the 2016 task in the Outback Challenge was to fly around a 30 kilometre um, route. Uh, in total, we ended up flying about 60 kilometres round trip, including all the search and things along a defined route, autonomously find Outback Joe. Now for the 2016 competition, that was Outback Joe on the left there. Right, which was the story was a farmer who was in distress and a blood sample needed to be collected from the farmer, preferably not via a propeller. Uh, and that blood sample had to be brought back to base to be analysed. And of course, any doctors among you would know that that is a fairly weak premise of actually collecting a blood sample like that. But the point is to advance UAV technology, not to actually develop a practical medical service. This, the stuff we develop is used in medical applications a lot, but not in quite the way it's used in this competition. So one of the challenges was maintaining constant radio link, even when it landed at the remote site. So I'll be in this talk talking a fair bit about the radio technologies, the networking, and a lot of Linux stuff involved in that, involved in our solution. Um, the picture on the right there is what that guy on the left looked like from our aircraft when we found him. Right? The little blue square is our little image recognition algorithm that's saying, hmm, that could be Joe. Right? But notice that the picture on the left is pretty obvious what he is. But when you're a UAV flying along at 100 kilometers an hour, you know, 120 meters in the air, um, then that's what he looks like, that little white blob. And the most distinctive part of it actually is that dark shadow, which allows you to measure his height. Uh, and so, the, the image recognition task is actually quite challenging. Um, you get a lot of little white blobs like that all over the search area. Um, and with, that was the, the particular one that happened to be Joe in this case. All right, so let's dive a little bit into to some of the technology and, and the challenge. So this was the, the mission. We started up there, that little symbol, house symbol, home. And you had to fly initially south uh, down that right-hand leg of the mission. You had to stay inside the green lines the entire time or you were instantly disqualified. 
And, and they're a bit harsh about that disqualification. You have to actually prove that if you cross one of those lines, your aircraft will instantly dive into the ground and destroy itself. That is a requirement, right? Um, for because they're not allowed to fly outside that area. And so if anyone, they have to prove beforehand your aircraft will destroy itself if it ever crosses that line. Um, the distance, this sort of distance, distance between home and that bottom left corner is about 12 kilometers. So you've got to fly down that leg, back up the leg, flying over the spectators, down this leg, down to the bottom left corner. And then the aircraft has to autonomously land, find Joe at the remote location, and then automatically find a landing position for the aircraft in the remote location in unknown terrain, land at that location, shut down, collect the blood sample when the, you know, the farmer comes out and shoves his blood sample he's collected himself out of his arm with his pocket knife, um, and put that into the uh, vehicle, and then the farmer then presses a button and the aircraft a minute later after, you know, sounding various alarms and things, telling the farmer, get away, we're about to take more blood. Um, and then it's got to take off and then fly all the way back. And there's no runway where you're going to. Um, you've got to take off and land vertically because there's trees around the area and scrub and that sort of thing. Um, and so it has to really be a VTOL aircraft. And this was the theme of the 2016 competition. They were trying to push VTOL UAVs. And the result of the competition was an enormous amount of time invested by many, many groups all over the world, researchers and hobbyists alike, developing new types of VTOL aircraft. And the little aircraft down the bottom left there, that's uh, our fixed wing VTOL. And I'll be talking more about that in a minute. The one in the middle there is our helicopter. We had two aircraft. Um, one aircraft was a radio relay, uh, a flying network node, a relaying signals from the ground station because you have to maintain constant network contact and control of the aircraft throughout the entire competition, including when it's landed uh, 12 kilometers away uh, through a forest. And point-to-point -point links really aren't all that great when pushing through a forest like that. So uh, we decided to have a relay aircraft in between, which would act as relaying the signals from our ground station to maintain that constant contact. And that, of course, started a whole interesting story about uh, the sorts of things that can go wrong with that. So that was our basic strategy. Helicopter relay aircraft and a retrieval aircraft, which was a fixed wing aircraft, but had the capability bolted onto it rather inelegantly of being able to take off and land vertically. All right. So this is our retrieval aircraft, and it's a 2.7 meter wingspan VQ Porter. It's the sort of thing you see at local flying clubs that people tootle around with as a radio control aircraft. Uh, basically, you can buy it as a kit, a relatively large kit. It's, it's not a giant scale model, but it's larger than your average radio control model. Um, it ended up weighing about 15 kilograms. This model is designed to weigh about six or seven kilograms, but once we crammed all our stuff into it, it was a little overweight, and thus had to be strengthened considerably. Um, the really unusual thing about this aircraft is you'll notice that it's got more than one propeller. Um, this aircraft is designed to have one engine and one propeller at the front. You know, it's a classic, it's a model of a full-sized aircraft called the Porter that's often used in uh, places like the Swiss Alps, thus the Swiss livery on it. And we added eight more propellers, uh, which were vertical ones, so an octaquad multi-rotor configuration so the aircraft could take off and then transition to forward flight and then land vertically, but using a big brute force petrol motor on the front to allow it to plough through the air despite all the extra air resistance from all this other stuff we've got hanging off it. Um, plus a bunch of radio antennas and uh, all that sort of thing. Um, due to a number of accidents, this wasn't the plane we were actually planning to use. Um, there was a, a much more beautifully built plane by our primary builder, Jack uh, Pitar and our team. And this was put together as a test aircraft over a weekend, this particular one by Grant Morford and myself. Um, and unfortunately, Jack's aircraft, beautifully built, it crashed uh, due to a, a, a servo failure. And um, we ended up bringing this test aircraft for use in the actual competition. And that's why you may notice that there's a lot of zip ties and uh, electrical tape and that sort of thing, because that's the sort of build uh, Grant and I are. 
Um, and so it's not quite the beautiful piece of engineering that uh, we were aspiring to when we were putting things together. Um, all right, that's our retrieval aircraft. And uh, this is the helicopter. This was much better built. Uh, this was put together by Greg Oakes, who's down in the audience here today. And uh, it's a GX9 Gowie 50cc petrol helicopter. So it's on the larger side of model helicopters. Um, it is specifically designed to be a UAV by Gowie. And they gave us a very good deal on, on buying a couple of these. So we had it set up so it could either be the retrieval aircraft or the relay, but we actually deployed it as the relay aircraft on the day of the competition. That's why you can see the little blood carrying canister there on one of its legs or horizontally. That's because it can act as a retrieval aircraft um, if it needs to. You can also see a bunch of antennas sticking up from the tail at the back there and uh, you know, extra GPSs and all sorts of things. So really nicely built um, helicopter that was our, our flying network node to act as a radio relay. All right, so um, redundancy is really important in these types of aircraft. We learned this early on. Um, we learned to assume that things were gonna fail and that um, these types of aircraft, they're notoriously hard to get right. So we actually flew a VQ Porter in the 2014 competition, uh, the, the one that, that won the Outback Challenge in 2014. And when we were first experimenting with um, uh, quad planes, this, is this type of aircraft is called a quad plane because it combines a quadcopter and a fixed wing plane. Um, when we were first experimenting, we put four motors on verticals. We had a quadcopter, and then we had the forward thrust for, to make a classic quad plane. And um, really, it flew quite well. We were very happy with it. And then we had a little bit of an accident. So I thought I'd tell you the story of that accident. Um, so it destroyed that aircraft, which is quite sad, because that was our, you know, the, 26, the 2014 aircraft that had won, the competition for us in 2014. And it had the four rotors. And one of those rotors, when it was hovering at a height of about 20 metres, uh, failed. So it became a tricopter suddenly. And this type of aircraft really doesn't fly well as a tricopter. It basically just you know, lurches to one side and starts tumbling out of the air. And then when 15 kilograms of balsa hits the ground, um, it tends to make lots of little pieces of balsa. So but the interesting thing was the, we had analysed why it failed. And we learn a lot from analysis of, of failures. And it turned out that one of the electronic speed controllers, you can see on the bottom right, um, was, uh, had burnt out. And so we started opening up those electronic speed controllers and having a look at them. And there is something about this ESC, those among you, who, who's an electronics person, knows a bit about FETs and speed controllers? A few people in the audience? So can anyone in the audience tell me what is a bit odd about that ESC in the bottom right corner? Anyone spot it? Yeah? No heat sinks? Yeah, we've taken off the heat sink. There's a, normally a big heat sink. It's very important. You're, you're very close to the clue. So there's a big heat sink that goes over the top of that that dissipates the heat from these FETs. And there's a lot of current running through these FETs and they get very, very hot and you need to dissipate a lot of heat out of them, otherwise they're going to fail. So what's the interesting thing? One of them's got a quality control sticker on it. And that quality control sticker insulated that FET from the heat sink. So if only the person on the day in the factory had skipped doing the quality control on this one and hadn't stuck the past sticker on the FET, then we probably would have still had that aircraft. Uh, so it's the sort of thing that, that goes on in this world. You know, the, the manufacturing of these things is sometimes a, a little uh, less good than you might hope for. So we discovered that um, Nearly all the ESCs had a quality control sticker covering a FET in between the, uh, the, the heat sink and the FET. And the one that was covered by the quality control sticker on the one that failed had burnt out because uh, it got too hot, which was disappointing. Anyway, so our response to this was um, to put eight motors instead. Because with eight vertical motors, um, if one of them fails, then the other seven can still fly the aircraft. And we, that actually happened to us a number of times. Um, most famously, in the actual competition flight on the day, the, the first takeoff, with all the cameras running, news crews and everything, the 
left bottom uh, rear motor did not spin up on the takeoff. It still took off beautifully and flew the competition. We didn't actually notice till we analyzed the logs later and looked carefully at the video and saying, damn it, that one's not spinning. But it did spin on the landing at the remote site and the takeoff at the remote site and the final landing back at home again. So it recovered, but it didn't spin up on that first time. So these things were really a problem for us. And um, it's something that if we were to use this, this aircraft again, we really need to find a way to make sure those ESCs really do spin up the motors. All right, so we went to this octa-quad configuration with the eight motors, and um, that leads to a much greater degree of reliability in the aircraft, and it saved the aircraft, you know, multiple times. So now I'll talk a bit about the network, because in many ways this challenge was a networking problem. And um, of course, you know, my reaction to this is throw a whole bunch of Linux boxes at this and uh, you know, a whole bunch of um, simple C programs and proxy scripts and that sort of thing. We ended up with a very complex network. So I'll explain a bit about the tip topology on it. Then I'll explain about what went wrong um, and what went right about this network setup. So on the top left there, we have the helicopter. And on the top right there, we have the porter. Now, it's the retrieval aircraft, so it's going to be going to the remote site and landing at the remote site to collect a blood sample. And the relay aircraft's job is to ensure that we maintain radio contact with the retrieval aircraft. So the arrangement we had was uh, we had two Raspberry Pis sitting down the bottom with two laptops, two ground stations. We wanted a high degree of redundancy so that pretty much anything could fail um, and it would keep working. And we did a whole lot of um, testing where uh, Grant was running our scenarios and we would be running simulations of the entire system, including all the, the real radios working in the simulations. And Grant would say, that's now failed. And we'd unplug it, it's gone, right? And you've got to continue. And that's now failed. And this aircraft's gone or whatever. And explain, okay, how are you going to continue? So we went through these scenarios. So the, the basic way the network works, the little black radios are what's called RFD900X. They're a, a 900 megahertz radio based on a little 32-bit system on a chip. And uh, we wrote, a, or we enhanced a firmware for it um, uh, to add mesh networking. So it's just a three-node mesh, but it meant that the, that little black radio at the bottom uh, left connected to uh, one of the laptops, actually, it could send packets to the retrieval aircraft via the relay aircraft, so relaying the packets through. But that same link could also provide telemetry control of the helicopter, right? So the one radio link provides control to both. And um, each of the aircraft also has two 3G dongles. So one Telstra, one Optus, because we wanted to bet both ways. We didn't want, the, the whole competition, two years effort comes down to one hour. You have one hour to complete. If you can't complete in that hour, you come back in two years, right? So you really got to be sure you don't want, you know, I'm sorry, Telstra's down for half an hour. You're out. So you don't want to rely on one network. So we had both Telstra and Optus dongles in each of the aircraft and on the ground stations. And we had two different cloud services. One was AWS, the other was auslabs.org, the, the Auslab server in Canberra, acting as uh, cloud services proxying connections and um, they were proxying UDP packets for the Mavlink protocol. Then each of the laptops had um, three connections up to, uh, to aircraft and then multiple ground stations going to the multiple aircraft. Um, and uh, so basically we were brainstorming ways in which this could fail. What if this radio went? What if that radio went? What if this one went? Would we still have control? Would we be able to pass through packets? Because we were expecting certain degrees of failure. We we're expecting that the, we wouldn't be able to get direct contact 900 megahertz uh, from ground to ground to the retrieval aircraft, had to go via relay. We were expecting the 3G to be marginal when it was on the ground at the remote site because we didn't know exactly where the remote site was until you know, right before the, the competition started and we didn't have any way to find out exactly how good the coverage might have been in that area with the towers. Um, 
So, but there's sort of things that, that hit us were, were interesting. The, the night before the competition, we were doing some testing in the town, was in Dolby, um, and this little town in uh, Queensland. And uh, so we're in, in Dolby and doing some testing and found that the 3G modems kept browning out. And it turns out that the power requirements of these 3G modems uh, significantly increases when you are further away from the tower. And our power supply for the Raspberry Pis wasn't keeping up, and so the radios were browning out when they were trying to talk to the tower further away. So then there was a sort of late night thing to you know, bypass the power into the Raspberry Pi, connect up new battery packs, et cetera, to try to beef up the power supply to these 3G modems so they could actually work even then without further away from the tower. Because when we were testing in Canberra, towers were much closer. So that was interesting. Um, so anyway, we got all this, this system set up. Um, the, the wiring was actually much more complex than this. I've sort of simplified it somewhat. And then, of course, things go wrong. Not everything goes quite as planned. Actually, before I go and, and show you that next thing, I'll show you what it looked like on our ground station. Um, so this is what uh, the view looked like from our ground control stations. That's the aircraft doing the search in, on the right and where it's doing this uh, cloverleaf pattern search to find Joe in a particular area. And the little uh, images showing up there are the images that it's taking which it thinks are of interest to show on the ground station. And it's highlighting areas on the ground that are of interest. There's Joe that it's just found on there. And so this is the type of you know, command and control station that we had for controlling the, the aircraft and uh, showing up graphs. We see three radio links for this particular aircraft. You see them going yellow. That's lag as the radios lag and come in and out of lag and they get delayed and it works out which, which link to prioritize based on how much lag it's got going to, uh, to via each of the radio links to each of the aircraft. So, so back to this again, and we see what, of course, things go wrong that we didn't expect to go wrong. And this is something that didn't quite go the way we planned. That's our relay aircraft, our radio relay. And what was happening was it was hovering beautifully um, above the search area, just about above the organizer's um, tent, uh, where they were you know, 100, 150 meters away from where Joe was, and they had a tent there, and they were monitoring things. And then on the ground station, we, it was sitting at about, say, 600 feet or so, and we heard you know, 600 feet. Then, then the ground station announced 500 feet, 450 feet, 400 feet. Uh-oh, uh that's not right. Um, and at that point, uh, I was you know, trying to frantically do things on the helicopter, and we realized that uh, it was losing height rapidly but we weren't quick enough, and it plummeted to the ground, a uh, rather heavy, scary vehicle with a massive, you know, rotating blade, um, just a few meters from where the organizers were standing. And this was a brown pants moment for the organizers, uh, because these sort of helicopters can be dangerous when they hit you in the head. Um, so anyway, that of course meant that our great network plan had a slight spanner in the works, because if you think about this network plan here, we no longer have that top left aircraft or its radios. And so at that point, the, the retrieval aircraft was still circling and had found Joe. And the organizers then thought very carefully about to whether to allow us to land the retrieval aircraft after that. We're the only team that had found Joe, the only team that had, that had uh, had a, the possible chance of, of landing and retrieving the blood sample. Not, uh, all the other teams previously had crashed out. So they eventually decided they would let us land, and we were able to give the command to say continue, and it continued the autonomous mission to land, and it successfully landed and, re and retrieved the blood sample. But there were still some interesting moments uh, with this, because once it landed, we didn't have the relay aircraft, so our point-to-point -point link started to get very dodgy, and the 3G link got very dodgy. So this is what the network latency looked like. Um, on the 3G link. That's in seconds on the left-hand axis. <laughs> so that meant that commands going to this aircraft um, were arriving 80 seconds after they were sent, and the telemetry was 80 seconds old. Now, this is not good when you've got an aircraft that's, that's going maybe you know, 90, 100 kilometers an hour, because the command is not necessarily relevant. Now, we did have a whole bunch of code to cope with network lag, but it topped out at about 10, 15 seconds that it could handle, 
and this was a way beyond that. Now, this was the Optus modem, which was a lot worse than the, the Telstra modem. The Telstra modem uh, did get lag, but not to the same extent. But it really showed us, you know, um, we should have been considering really high lag scenarios. And we were incredibly lucky we got packets through it all. And in fact, what happened was that all three radio links we had to that retrieval aircraft did continue to work when we were on the ground, but we didn't ever have all three of them working at the same time. The point-to-point -point actually got some packets through, through the forest, right, um, due to a, a very nicely designed radio from RF Design. Um, and the, each of the 3G modems did get packets through, but um, so at no point did we lose complete contact with the aircraft, but none of the links stayed up for the entire time it was on the ground. And so uh, things got very interesting there. And uh, we did manage to give it a command to, uh, when we had to say to continue the mission once they'd loaded the blood sample and continue the autonomous mission and come home. And there was a long delay before it received that command and did actually do the takeoff and make all its, its way back. So that brings us, so we ended up, we retrieved the blood sample and we, um, we did uh, win the competition, but we didn't get the grand prize because the grand prize, one of the requirements was that you bring all your aircraft home. And it didn't count bringing it home in a bag, unfortunately. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's fine. Uh, so 2018 competition raised the bar again because we completed the competition last time. They've, they've got to make it harder. So um, this year, they've added a number of things that to make it considerably harder. First of all, your aircraft has to autonomously dodge other aircraft on the way. All right, that means it's got to do path planning. It's got um, a pseudo ADSB system, which is like used in full-sized aircraft, providing telemetry data from other aircraft in the area, which are going to be virtual aircraft run by the organizers. And your aircraft has to dodge the, those aircraft, but still ma manage to make it to the destination. You also have to find the target using image recognition. The target is something that the farmer has printed out on his inkjet printer this time. And the, you've got to use image recognition. We're using a Raspberry Pi camera and a Raspberry Pi on the plane to recognize that target uh, automatically from inside the aircraft. The really hard challenge though, and this is one that I am extremely doubtful that anyone's going to achieve this year, is that to get the grand prize, you have to do the entire mission from say, go at the beginning, take off of your aircraft to all of them back and land and all done without touching the keyboard or mouse on the ground station at all. You can have a status screen up, but if you touch anything in the, in the flight, you don't get the grand prize. Now, that's incredibly difficult. Um, partly, it's incredibly difficult, you know, psychologically for us sitting there with our aircraft, you know, 15, 20 kilometers away, running along at 100 kilometers an hour, and what is it doing? You know, uh, if a screensaver kicks in, I'm going to scream. <laughs> so that's really hard. We don't know whether that's going to be achievable, but it's a, it's a great thing to aim for. Uh, very interesting. So we're looking at new types of aircraft. We could do this competition with the same aircraft we used last time. Um, but instead, we like innovating in new areas. So we've been looking at new types of aircraft for this one. And um, We've got this new type of aircraft that was actually invented by someone called Richard Yonica on the Ardu Pilot forums. And I'm just going to show you a quick video of what that looks like. And um, so this is the, the flights of his first, what's called TVBS. He's focusing in there. So I'll just pause it there. You can see this is like a flying wing and it's got two propellers at the front. But you may notice those propellers are at 90 degrees to the airframe, right? So watch what happens when it takes off. All right, it's now hovering as a fixed wing aircraft and it's got enormous amounts of control with vectored thrust on those two forward motors. Incredible amounts of control. So as soon as I saw this, I contacted uh, Richard. He wasn't running Ardupal at the time and um, uh, he'd knocked together his own autopilot, in fact, to do this and uh, talked to him about uh, supporting this type of vehicle in Ardupilot, and he's now running Ardupilot on, on his vehicles, and a lot of other people are now running Ardupilot on this type of vehicle, what we're calling a TVBS. It's similar in many ways to something called a tail sitter that many of you might have seen, but it's much more wind resistant on the ground because it lies down flat, and it's got vastly more degrees of control with the vectored thrust. 
really quite incredible the amount of control you get with this type of aircraft. I'll just show you what it does when the landing, it's about to come in for a landing here. And so it touches down on the tail and then, there it goes. And then it flops down and the propellers are now horizontal again. So really a beautiful aircraft. All right, so we of course need a much bigger thing than that. So we've got a three meter wingspan. This is a simulated model of the aircraft that we're still building um, and much, much larger. But what I can show you briefly is the a video of what this is like in the simulator. So I'll just fast forward a bit because a bit lower on time. This is our aircraft flying in a flight simulator and a three meter wingspan, large tail, uh, a lot more efficient. We're actually looking at possibly going to three motors on it. And if I forward on it a little bit, you'll see it transitioning to forward flight. There it's in forward flight. It basically tilts forward and goes to forward flight and it can land similarly to that one. So that's what we're building, both software and hardware for that type of aircraft and really interesting type of aircraft to be working on. All right, so RG Pilot development in general. Um, I've talked in previous years about the Linux port of RG Pilot. Uh, RG Pilot is uh, aggressively portable to lots of different operating systems and, and flight boards. There's something like 40 different flight boards we run on. It now supports 20 different Linux boards, 20 different variants of these embedded Linux boards of various sorts. Um, we've also got, most of our users are actually on STM32 microcontrollers and we're shifting those to Shibios at the moment, uh, which is, we were on Nutex and Shibios is much smaller and faster. Any Shibios users here? Not many? Well, Shibios is a wonderful tiny Artos, wonderful little operating system, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's uh, uh, released under the GPL and uh, extremely efficient, very close to the hardware, really nicely done. We also have a very successful partners program. RG Pilot has uh, currently 34 commercial partners, companies that support RG Pilot development. Uh, it's been massively successful, people supporting us with financial contributions, hiring developers to work on the project. And we're really grateful to all of the partners for the support they, that they give us. So these are some of the new Linux autopilots we've had in uh, the last couple of years since I've last talked uh, here at uh, LCA. So we've got the Pocket Beagle on the bottom left corner, um, which is a lovely little tiny board, uh, community driven. The BeagleBone Blue, which has all the sensors built in, very nice little board for, with lots and lots of I.O. Um, we've got the uh, Emlid Edge, which is aiming at much higher end commercial applications. Um, and we've got the Octo, which is a, a Okpok, which is an FPGA-based um, autopilot. Uh, we've got the Intel Aero system, which uh, runs Linux, but also can run the autopilot STM32. And we've got the Parrot Chuck, which is in the Disco uh, fixed wing aircraft flying wing. Um, they're just some of the recent ones, but as I mentioned, there's actually 20 different Linux, embedded Linux boards that now run ArduPilot, and it's really thriving, the community that are developing applications around um, Linux and ArduPilot. So there's another one I wanted to talk about, which is at the other end of the scale from our large Outback Challenge planes. Our big Outback Challenge plane is about 15 kilograms, um, and that's by no means the largest plane running ArduPilot. This is 145 grams. And so this is a very interesting little aircraft. Um, it's, a, it's a mass market uh, drone running ArduPilot with all of the firmware open uh, under the GPL, ranging from the video firmware, driving the video board, the STM32 flight code, all of the code for the transmitter. And this is selling at uh, Costco in Australia and Toys R Us and places like that. Really mass market drone, but completely open and hackable, but also full featured in terms of having GPS support, navigation, um, lots of tools, etc. So we're delighted that companies in the mass market drone business are interested in working with the Arduino pilot development community in developing drones like this. If anyone wants to have a fly of this thing later, you're very welcome to. So. Uh, it's got a, a 400 megahertz Sonics ARM 926 for its video board, um, beautiful little video processor, STM8 for RC control, and an STM32 427 for the flight control, and all the firmware released up on, the, uh, on GitHub. All right, so I wanted to leave a few uh, minutes for questions, so I'll um, pause there and see if there's any questions. So. Um, 
Any questions about, all about what we're doing with ArduPilot? Yes, down the front here. Uh, in a previous year, you mentioned a contest that was going to deal with uh, radio interference, specifically uh, malicious GPS, I think. Mm -hmm. um, did anything come from that? Um, so there's been lots of work done on uh, improvements to GPS over the past few years. Most of the focus has been on low-cost RTK. So RTK is real-time kinematic, which is a methodology for achieving much greater degrees of accuracy in GPS positioning down to the centimetre level. And there's been uh, that, those types of systems, when I was presenting a couple of years ago, were around $10,000 or so. And uh, an ANU researcher and myself worked on some low-cost alternatives to that, uh, which tried to get the accuracy down to sub-metre. Um, now you can get, for a few hundred dollars, um, RTK systems that can get you down to the centimetre level much better than what we managed to achieve and they're really reliable. And there's a, there's a, um, a couple of them also that are um, open source, which is fantastic to see. So really nice seeing free software implementations of GPSs, and uh, there's a very active development community around developing um, better GPS solutions, mostly for mapping applications, very accurate mapping applications. Cool. Yep. Next question. Thanks yep. very much for that. I'm, I'm interested that you see, you're sort of implying that you're now doing all of your takeoffs and landings vertically, even though you're running on a fixed wing aircraft that could take on off horizontally. Yeah, any particular reason v VTOL, for that? VTOL, for this competition, VTOL is absolutely required, but it's also just fun. <laughs> um, so these aircraft, it, when you see an aircraft like that 15 kilogram Porter, 2.7 mean spin span, just taking off vertically like that, it just it looks like it, it flies like a brick does, but uh, you know, it really looks very, very odd seeing it do that. And then you know, screaming along at 100 kilometers an hour, and then suddenly shh, coming to a stop and just hanging there and, and going down. That is a lot of power going into that. Um, it's capable of, um, uh, it, people who take off is about uh, five kilowatts, but it can put up to about 10 kilowatts through those motors. So there's a lot of power there, a lot of current, a lot of opportunity for things to go bang, uh, which is great fun. Um, but uh, yeah, so VTOL is a really important part of it. And one of the interesting things is that when people make aircraft VTOL, it doesn't necessarily lower the range. So there are people, a lot of people have discovered that when they take a fixed wing aircraft and they load it up with extra propellers vertically, um, it also solves the problem. One of the limiting factors in the range of uh, a normal fixed wing aircraft is the launch and the launch techniques to get enough airspeed to get it going. Once you're flying fast, you can be really heavy as long as you've got enough speed to keep the lift. But the launch is often the limiting factor to how much battery you can cram on one of these things. And because the launch is now vertical easy, you can actually cram a lot more battery onto one of these aircraft than you could with a traditional fixed wing. So people are finding they're actually surprised that even with the extra drag of the vertical lift motors, that you can actually get very good ranges. And people have flown them for two hours, even three hours, these types of, of aircraft. Um, in our case, it's more a brute force one, um, and it's a very draggy aircraft. But the one we're looking at building that TVBS style, um, where the belly setter, that's vastly more efficient. Um, and it needs to be because we're hoping to go all electric, which means it doesn't have that massive energy density of the petrol for its fuel, so it must be more efficient to be able to uh, achieve the parameters of this particular competition. Just wondering, what caused the helicopter to come down? All oh, right. So Greg's actually got a detailed report on that that he's going to be releasing shortly. Um, but it's, um, it looks like the most likely cause um, was a failed throttle servo. And so there was a throttle servo, and it's been failing on some other aircraft of, of this same type, um, where basically the throttle um, suddenly glitched to zero, and the engine stalled. I mean, it so goes suddenly from you know, nearly full throttle to zero, and the engine just cut out. Um, and uh, it, it was interesting. We, the, we developed a system for automatically restarting the motor in flight, which we used a number of times on our fixed wing aircraft, because it's got a starter motor. It, it, the retrieval aircraft has to have in-air restart because it lands at the remote site with no operator, it needs to restart its motor, and it has to restart it after it's taken off vertically so the propeller doesn't hit stuff on the ground, right? Um, so we had developed all the software for automatic engine restart, and we'd proven it a, a number of times in flight, 
and we'd also developed that code for the helicopter, but we'd never proven it because we only developed the helicopter automatic engine restart a week or so beforehand. And so we decided because we'd never had the engine fail on this thing, we thought we won't enable the automatic restart. Um, so, but while it's plummeting from, the, from you know, 600 feet to the ground, there isn't quite enough time to enable the two or three parameters in the aircraft you need to enable automatic engine restart. And so it, uh, it met its end. Um, yep. uh, have you ever had any trouble with bird strikes? We haven't ourselves. We've certainly had some um, hawks showing interest in our planes, but not actually hitting them, but other people have. Um, it's, not a, it's not a really significant problem. Um, and uh, the, you know, I think the aircraft is a bit big and scary for most birds, uh, so they tend to stay away from it. Um, they sometimes you know, chase in behind, like a you know, wedge tail might chase behind a, an RC aircraft. But in our particular case, it's, it's never been a problem. Uh, how much interest do you get from search and rescue, rescue groups for what you do? Oh, there's quite a number of search and rescue groups that are uh, using drones and, and a number who are using ArduPilot. And that was one of the original focuses of our development. And we've been delighted that, there's a, um, uh, that there are groups using it. Um, the Peace River Search and Rescue Group in the United States, for example, using ArduPilot in our software and a number of other groups um, using it. Um, also other teams. We, we had an attitude right from the beginning that all of our stuff would be open so everyone can use it. You know, it's all going to be free software and we release the code as we write it. We don't release it after the competition. So we're delighted that you know, just about every team in the competition uses some of our code now. Nearly all of them run ArduPilot now. And other competitions around the world, people are running ArduPilot plus real search and rescue applications. ArduPilot is really quite widely used. So we're de really delighted by that. Um, it's not dominant at all in search and rescue, but um, probably DJI drones, simple uh, quadcopters uh, would be the dominant form used in various search and rescue applications. But in the more sophisticated area, it's used. Um, the Red Cross using it and a number of organizations using it for uh, medical deliveries and, and other you know, uh, humanitarian applications, plus research, environmental applications, which we're delighted at. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if uh, you have thought about using the helicopter blades in normal flight to actually provide extra lift um, in a, the same yes, way as the helicopter. Yes, that is a very actually. interesting one. In fact, there is a company here in Australia who've developed a very interesting aircraft, um, and they are we're developing. We're working with the they're working with the IG pilot development team, and in fact, they that's a company called Stop Rotor. And if you want to see one of the really bleeding edge aircraft in the world today, go and search for Stop Rotor, stoprotor.com.au. It's an amazing uh, aircraft they developed. And in fact, it is a hybrid fixed wing helicopter where a lot of the lift comes from the helicopter blade locked into position and acting as the wing in forward flight. Um, and, but taking off as a helicopter, transitioning to forward flight, locking the blade in as a wing and then having a pusher to, to do it, and it's an incredibly innovative aircraft, but there's a lot of technical challenges in making that work correctly. So uh, I'd highly recommend you have a look at stoprotor.com.au if you want to see what the bleeding edge of UAE de development is all about. You mentioned the uh, Sky, Sky Viper, the V2450. Yep. Is there any additional programming hardware for the device or the uh, transmitter that's required to actually participate in ArduPilot development and updating it? So you can update all of the firmwares remotely. Um, even the, the little transmitter firmware, you can actually send it a new firmware remotely because it's got um, a system where it can you know, accept a new firmware into its flash and then the bootloader copying on the next boot. The uh, firmware uh, for the main flight controller, again, can be updated remotely. It's got a Wi-Fi interface where it offers a web interface which allows you to look at the guts of all of the options, a thousand parameters to you can twiddle to your heart's content plus uh, an upgrade screen where you can just click and load a new firmware via the web interface. And all that web interface is also open. Uh, it's in fact based on a, a web server, that I, an embedded web server I wrote many, many years ago. It's, it's running, the, the video process is running free RTOS. Um, and it's a tiny little embedded um, ARM926 running at 300 megahertz with this tiny little web server. And, uh, but it's got a, a lot of capabilities. So yes, it is all upgradable. If you want to actually get and debug it with GDB, then you need to get out your soldering iron and some very careful soldering to add on the necessary 
um, you know, wires to be able to get at the programming ports if you want to single step the code. So if you want to get into it at a really low level, um, then you've got to get out your soldering iron. But if you just want to change the code and upload a, a new firmware, um, then uh, you can do so without even opening, opening it up. No screwdriver required. Uh, all the firmware is upgraded remotable, re remotely. And the main flight controller firmware, you can quite safely upgrade it because of the way the bootloader is set up. If you, you can't brick it. If you get a bad firmware on it, you can still, via the micro SD card, load a new firmware and replace your bad firmware. So it is, in fact, it was one of the reasons it was so exciting for the RG Pilot community is it's a fantastic development platform that is incredibly cheap and very, very robust. It's, it's a hard to kill copter, uh, which makes it great for development effort. One of the fun things we do with it is uh, launches by just throwing it, uh, picking it in the air and just throw it really hard and it, it then flies, uh, which is great fun. Okay, well thanks Andrew for that presentation. That was really great. Got a present from the organizers here for you. Thank you very much. Thank Trent. you very much. Thank you.